But okay, now we go to 81, get a printout and find out, gee, if we serve the big hitter, do they set? Or if we serve him, can he hit the ball? Or if we serve the left side hitter, do they set him? Or you can find out all that stuff. Back in those days, I had a big baseball bag with about eight clipboards, and I had everybody scouting everything. And then after the game, they'd give it all to me, and then I'd take it to my room and work three hours to find out how many points we scored on each rotation, and whether it was plus minus. And basically did the same stuff, but it took a lot of man hours to do it. Well, Greg Giovanazzi, my trusted assistant 81, his job was to hustle a 16 millimeter videotape over to Hollywood, pick it up the next morning, start cutting the tape up to our six side out rotations, pasting it on the wall, and our six scoring rotations, pasting that on the wall, taping them together so we had 12 different rotations. Because if we were playing this team the next night, which we did sometimes, like play Hawaii back to back, BYU back to back, then we'd have to show the team this, show them the 16 millimeter film. So these film, you know, basically Gio didn't have much sleep, and he'd be there hiding off, and the film would break. And then, Damn it, Gio, get up there and fix the film, because <laughs> you know we'd only want to spend an hour looking at this. He still talks about that. That was the worst, absolute worst job. <laughs> But somebody had to do it. It wasn't going to be me. <laughs> so, 81, um, we had a pretty good team. Ricky Lutte started that year. He started four NCAA championships. And Karch was still setting. We had a freshman named Doug Partee. Now, Doug uh, went on to become an Olympian, played in three Olympics, and um, won a gold medal in 88. So the coach at Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Barbara, UCSB, told him, well, Doug, you're not very good right now. Go to Santa Barbara City College. I'll look at you in a couple of years. And uh, Doug started for us that year as a true freshman. Now, Steve Sammons is rehabbing, his second year of rehabbing. And he, he comes in, his back isn't as bad now. He's just got, you know, he's, he's getting there. He's on the stationary bike, he's doing stretching. And so we get to the, um, the, the seminars. I play him about a game and a half. Now we get to the finals, and in the finals, I say to Doug Partee, now, I know Steve can't, can't go more than two games. Stay warm, stay warm. Meanwhile, going back a week, my starting outside hitter, Dave Saunders, goes through the windshield in a terrible car accident. He has 75 stitches in his face. And, so I start a 5'10 outside hitter named Peter Irwin, who is very good. It's his fourth year starting in the championship game. But he didn't play all year. So we go out there, and the fans are loving us there. We're up in the event center in Santa Barbara. And I said, wow, this is great. We had 5,000 fans come up from LA. And SC walks up, and I'm up and they're booing them. I said, they're all our guys. This is wonderful. Well, it turns out that they had a player named Terrible Tim Hovland, Tim Hovland. And every time he played at Santa Barbara, he'd flip the crowd off. And they hated him. So they were just out there to see him lose and anybody win. So that day they were rooting for us. And we got, I finally, I said, well, this is Dave Saunders last year. I'm going to put him in. Just a back row. So he digs a ball right in the face. A couple of stitches blow, there's blood all over the ball. <laughs> no, you just, you know, that was before Magic Touch. You just wrap, you wipe the ball. <laughs> just, you know, oh, you can play this little play. You know, those days, I mean, it was totally different. So he's playing, he's a little messed up, but I had to take him out because the balls, we only had three game balls, they were getting all bloody. It was so, it's 14-13 in the fifth. Essie had a great team that year. Probably better than the one they had the year before. And we block a ball. Now, we had a veteran official, Wink Davenport, on the stand. He was our international official. Wink's a big guy. He played on the Olympic team in 64, but now he's about 290. He's really big since he quit playing. And 
and uh, we block them all. And Hovland gets it, he throws it up. Oh, back there, the, in those days, the referee never called anything on gate point. The ball had to hit the floor. Wink blows the whistle. Tim jumps up on top of the net, tries to tear the net down. Then he goes after Wink. I thought Wink was going to fall on him, crush him. He's pulling Wink, and it was just a beautiful sight. <laughs> That's what I remember about 81. Uh, we had a lot of interesting players on the, on the second team at UCLA through the years. And one of the most athletic moves I've ever seen, we had a player named Sean Mayo on the second team. And Sean was standing there with the boys, watching the game, he had his sweats on. And uh, he went over to the trainer and he got some tape. Pretty soon our opponent, that Paulie, hits one about 20 feet out. Sean runs out there, does the most athletic guy, and puts a big tank X on the floor, pivots around, and runs back in line. Boy, was that athletic. That's the only time he got in. <laughs> the other guy we had on that team that year was a guy named Dave Nichols. And Dave was a, a pretty free spirit in those days, and now he's a serious coach. And um, he was saying, the Cisco kid is a friend of mine during practice when he did some, make some extraordinary plays. And uh, he became known as Cisco. He had a fan club. And uh, they'd all say, you know, we want Cisco. Play Cisco. Well, you know, I didn't make lineup changes if we were winning. And we were winning with that team. So finally I said, Cisco, just get up there and sit with your friends. You know, <laughs> so he went up there and sat with them. And then I actually needed them. And I just put it in. Finally, I don't think you could do that today. 